So we're going to continue on today in our Renewed Mind series, and really this whole time that we have been talking about and preaching from the book of Mark, um, it, it really has been about renewing our minds. Um, even when we, it was a, a different title at one point where we flipped the script, it was still really about changing the way we think and changing our mindsets. And so today we're going to continue in that today, and the title for today's message is renewed, The Renewed Mind, When God Works Outside Our Box. When God works outside our box. Each one of us has a way of thinking. Each one of us has our own set of how we think God works. And it's oftentimes that when he, we don't see him working according to our, our preferences, when we don't see him working according to our timelines, that at times we do get offended with God. And we actually miss what he is doing because he's not doing it the way that we think he should. And so today we're going to start in Mark chapter 11, and this is now, we're coming into the Passion Week where um, the triumphant entry is about to take place, and um, this is near, this is towards the end of, of the Lord's earthly ministry, and Mark chapter 11, beginning with verse 1 through 11, we're going to skip uh, 12, 13, 14, jump back on Mark 11, 15 to 19, and then to the end of Mark 15, verse 12 to 15. If you would follow along with me. <clears throat> Mark 11, verse 1 to 11, reading from the King James Version. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing, loosing the colt? And they spoke to them, just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest! And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So, he, so when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Verse 15 to 19. This is now the next day. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught them, saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, he went out of the city. We're going to skip a couple of chapters and tie it all together in the end. Mark chapter 15, verse 12 to 15. What shall, I do with, what shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had, he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Father, as we go to your word today, I pray that you would encourage us. I pray that you would align us. I pray that you would grant us the right mindset. Lord, correct the way we think. Change our mind. We invite you today, Holy Spirit, to renew our minds that we would see according to how it should be and how you want us to see. Change our minds today, we pray. Holy Spirit, we need your help in preaching this word. And we need your help in hearing and understanding and living out this word. In Jesus' name, amen. I forgot to mention today that Happy and I are co-teaching this afternoon. And so 
we're going to try to stick to our 25 minute limit each we're going to try um, here is the story of Jesus remember we have been talking about when he came he was always challenging mindsets when he came he was always addressing the way people think because if he can change the way people think he can change the way people live and he was trying to change it not so that they can be good moral beings he was trying to change it so that they can be good kingdom citizens that they would be able to see the kingdom they would be able to understand the kingdom see how it works and be able to translate that world into this world and here again we see Jesus now coming into the Passion Week the triumphant entry and Jesus tells his disciples to go find him a coat. And it's interesting how the people that were gathered around him, when they saw Jesus coming in the coat, that they were all excited. That they all got excited and they began to cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna. We know this from the, from, from, from the, the Eastern narrative. Hosanna, Hosanna. You know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And, and, and unless we begin to do some word studies of what that word Hosanna means, we're going to miss it and we're just going to think it's some exclamation, it's some expression. You know, Hosanna, like we say hallelujah. Or when we say amen, in Jesus' name, amen. That word amen means so be it. So whenever we pray, when we say in Jesus' name, when the congregation says amen, what you're saying is so be it. We are all in agreement. Yeah. And Hosanna is one of those words that typically a lot of, you know, Christianity and churches say it a lot of times. But what we don't understand is what it really means. And here is the picture now. Jesus is coming riding on a donkey, riding on a, on a colt, riding on a foal. And, and, and when we don't understand the historical background of it we're not going to be really able to appreciate what is taking place because the the jews understood from prophetic words uttered hundreds of years before of what the king of jerusalem was going to come in writing they knew israel had always been looking for that king They'd always been looking for that great deliverer. They knew the promises of one is going to sit on the seat of David in Jerusalem and he's going to reign forever and ever. And he's going to totally uh, set them free from their enemy and they're going to be, they're going to rise up to this nation of God and this king was going to come one day, someday, down the road, a king is coming. And all the generations have been looking for that one man, that one deliverer that is the Messiah that is to come. And one of the telltale signs of this Messiah that is to come is he's going to come in riding on a donkey. He's going to come riding into Jerusalem. And a lot of times when in, in, in their culture and in their day, when kings would rout um, enemies, when they would, when they would conquer um, towns and cities, when they would conquer enemies, they would come riding back into town on horses you may have seen this in some of the you know, some of the you know knights and armor movies and you know some of the you know some of those knight's tale movies where the king always comes in first after they've defeated all the enemy that's trying to trying to attack them he comes riding back into town on a horse and he always goes first and he leads this he leads this parade behind him and and that was and the people would line up on the side of the streets and cheering on long live the king and and they're so thankful to the king for saving them and all of these things and so that was the picture that they understood that the savior was going to come Zechariah 9 9 they remember this word in the uh, in the through the prophet Zechariah rejoice greatly daughter Zion shout daughter Jerusalem see your king comes to you righteous and victorious lowly and riding on a donkey and a colt the foal of a donkey they remembered this when they saw the scene of Jesus riding this the donkey they were reminded of the prophetic words this is it finally this is that and we're going to be set free but what they were thinking was they were going to be set free from the Roman Empire and so here now they were celebrating Jesus 
When he says, when, the, when, when, when they begin to say, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were thinking, here now is the king that we have been awaiting for all these generations. And now we're going to get set free. Now Rome is going to be overthrown. And now we're going to have our own kingdom. The, 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 the seed of David is finally going to come. And he's going to reestablish our people. He's going to rise us up as a nation. In the Passion Translation, in Mark 11, 7 to 10, this is how it, that translation puts it. The disciples brought the colt to Jesus and piled their cloaks and prayer shawls on the young donkey, and Jesus rode upon it. Many people carpeted the road in front of them with their cloaks and prayer shawls, with others gathered, while others gathered palm branches and spread them before him. Jesus rode in the center of the procession, with crowds going before him and behind him. They all shouted in celebration, Bring the victory! We welcome the one coming with the blessings of being sent from the Lord Yahweh. Blessings rest on this kingdom he ushers in right now. The kingdom of our father David. Bring us the victory in the highest realms of heaven. And they are declaring this is the one. When, when, when they use the word Hosanna, what that means is actually save us. Save us. They recognize him as the king. And their anticipation was that they were, he was going to come and save them from the Roman Empire. And so they celebrated him. And they threw, their, they threw their clothes on him and uh, on the road. And it's, it's much like what we would do now with, with a red carpet you know, thing with, with important people. We roll out the red carpet because somebody important is coming. When you see the red carpet, you know somebody is celebrity, sports celebrity, somebody important is coming. And so they took off their cloaks and, and they took off their prayer shawls and they made sure to lay it at the feet of Jesus to make sure that, that, that he was going to ride in comfortably. Why? Because they were anticipating that he was going to come and, and he was going to fulfill their need. And so they went through all the trouble of laying down everything that they had at the feet of this coming king. And, and some went out all the way to cut down branches, palm leaves. And that's where we get this Palm Sunday. They would go and cut down palm leaves and they would lay it at the path of the king. Why? Because they wanted, they were expecting him to come. Their expectation was that he was going to come and relieve them of the oppression of the Roman Empire. It's so interesting how the people, how the crowd, the same crowd that were expecting the, that Jesus was going to do something for them, they went all the way, cut down branches, laid down everything they had because they were expecting him to do what they wanted him to do. Isn't it interesting that we go all the way? We see a lot... I'm not saying here, I'm saying in general. We see a lot of people come and give their all to Jesus. I'm just going to serve the Lord and, and, and I'm just going to serve in 50 ministries and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And, and they're so active in church. Why? Because they're anticipating because they have a need. And they're expecting that if I do this, you know, when, you're in, when you have a need, you're willing to do anything you can in order for Jesus to do your thing. Uh, and so you have that's why during exam time back home during exam time the youth group was full the whole place was full young students and they're just radically and they're crying and they're just praying Jesus, the, before the board exams okay like nursing teachers board exam engineering you know you can always tell what season it is by the type of uniforms that come into the youth group and so when you see like a whole influx of nurses, you know nursing, nursing exams coming, or the teachers, or you know what I mean? And, and you can always tell the engineering because they just don't dress like anything. They just, whatever, you know? Like sometimes they come in with clothes, sometimes, you know? But you can always tell. And, and they're just so, in, you know, passionate. And, and why? Because there's a need. Yeah. And they're willing to throw down everything. They're willing to give everything. Why? It just to, to manipulate the Lord to do what they want. And here now we see this crowd. This is not new. This is not unique to, this, to, to our generation. This has been ongoing. It's human nature to want to, to, to please God, to actually manipulate God. If I could just get his attention. Why? Because I want him to do what I need. 
And it's the very same people that they, they're, they're, they're there and they're crying, Hosanna, you're the one, we love you. And, and why? Because we need you to do something for us. What they didn't realize was that Jesus didn't come to fulfill their agenda. You see, they were wanting him to set them free from the Roman oppression, but Jesus came not to deal with the consequences. He came to deal with the root. They were under Roman oppression, oppression because of the consequence of idolatry. They were, you see, you look at the history of Israel. Every time they fell into idolatry, every time they disobeyed the Lord, every time that they turned away from God and began to worship other gods and, and began to compromise their life, it was, the Lord would allow enemies to come in just to bring them back to Him. It was his way of mercy. And, and what they wanted him to do was to deal with the consequences. But Jesus said, I'm not interested in dealing with the consequences. I'm here to deal with the root issue of why you are under oppression. And that's why you always hear me say, he, he's, he's, if, he can, if he can set you free from the inner enemy, you're not going to have to worry about the external enemies. External enemies are the consequences. Oh Lord, pray, I pray Lord that you would heal me. I pray God that you would heal my body. And guess what? The Lord not only wants to heal your body, but he wants to cause you to have self-control where you're watching over what you eat. Amen. Okay, then. You understand? what We want him to deal with, to take care of the consequences as long as we can continue to live the way we want. Now, realizing that the way we live, by living the way we want, is actually bringing us back to the very same consequence. It's this whole circle, this whole cycle of sin, this whole cycle. And so Jesus comes, and what was the first thing? They said, oh, you've come to set us free from our enemies. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name. And they celebrate him, and they throw what they had at his feet, and, and went out of their way and cut down branches to make everything smooth for Jesus. And the very first thing that we see Jesus do is go to the temple. Temple was the very epicenter of worship. Today we would consider, Jesus says, you, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But more so, I want to talk about the temple being our heart. And the very first place that we see Jesus going is into the very heart of worship, into the temple. And it was there that he began to actually deliver them. It was there that he actually began. It's in our hearts that the Lord is really trying to deal with. It's not so much the poverty or the lack of money. It's the greed that is in here that he's trying to deal with. Yeah. And he's, he goes into the temple. Why? Because a compromise has been made. He goes into the temple. Why? Because corruption has been found in the very epicenter of worship. And when there's, when there's corruption at the very epicenter of worship, it will, it will bleed into the rest of the body. And so he comes and he begins to drive out the, the money changers. He begins to drive out those that, that were given into corruption. And here's the deal. The corruption was between the, the business sector and the religious sector. People would come to offer their sacrifices to the Lord. And, and, the, and, and the religious leaders would actually look at the, the sacrifice and say, yeah, you know what, this is no good. You need to go buy from my friend over there. And his friend over there is in cahoots with him because... The priest is getting a cut from whatever he's selling. And so he would, sell, he would say, this is no good. You're going to have to go buy from Joe. But Joe is my friend. And he goes to Joe, and Joe sells him an, um, an imperfect sacrifice. And comes back, and, 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 and the priest would say, yeah, you know what, this is good enough. But Joe has charged him twice as much as what it actually cost. And that's why there was money changers there because they would, the Jews would have to come from other nations and they would have to exchange currency so that they were able to buy from Job. And so there's this corruption that is taking place within the very epicenter of worship. And Jesus comes to deal with the hearts. Jesus comes to deal with the corruption that is within us. That's why we're not looking for what people do outside. We're not looking for the actions and the way people dress. Because the Lord is looking directly at the hearts of individuals. And that is what he's going after. Yeah. And he begins to overturn. He begins to overturn. The wickedness, he begins to overturn the corruption, the compromises, he begins to address, this is my house, and the, and, and, and the Lord is zealous 
for his house? Do you know how zealous and how jealous the Lord is for your house, for your hearts? That's why you can't get away from the conviction. That's why nobody else is there. Your life group leader's not there. Pastor Nap's not there. Nobody knows is there. But the conviction of the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and, and nagging you, don't do this, don't do this, this is wrong. And, and so he's zealous about your heart. He wants to deal with the very heart issues that you and I have. He wants to drive out the corruption, drive out the greed. He's not wanting to just deal with the consequences. He wants to deal with the root issues. And when this took place, when they realized that, when the crowd realized that Jesus didn't come to do their bidding, pay attention now, when they realized that Jesus didn't come to do what they wanted him to do, chapter 15, as the very same people that says, crucify him. Crucify him. We expected him to do our thing. We expect we had we had certain expectation of him to what he needs to do, how he needs to do it, by what time he needs to do it, and he didn't conform to any of that. And the very same people that says Hosanna, Hosanna, because they didn't get what they want, they said crucify him. And how many friends and how many people do we know that didn't get their prayers answered? There were once so in love with Jesus, but because he didn't do what they wanted him to do, we don't see him no more. How many people do we know who believed in for healing uh, of a loved one and, and they, they, they quoted scripture and they believed God and, and, and they, they fasted and they prayed and they worshiped and they served all the more. Why? Because they wanted and, and wanted their, their loved one to be healed so badly and the, and the loved one never got healed but rather passed away. And next thing we know, those same people begin to snuff at God and, and turn away from God because they didn't get what they wanted from God. See, this is what we're talking about, the renewed mind. What does a renewed mind, how does a renewed mind tackle these issues when you don't get what you want? When the thing that you believed for, when the thing that you were so sure was from God walks out the door and marries somebody else. <laughs> What happens when the, the promises that you're hanging on to does not come to pass? Yeah. Is he still Lord? Is he still Lord? You see, a lot of times we end up following Jesus because down the road we're thinking, if I just follow Jesus, eventually it'll come to a point where he begins to follow me. And so... He did not do as was expected. And they said, crucify him. The very same people, the very same crowd who did not get what they were expecting, who did not get what they were preferring, who did not get their prayers answered, who did not have Jesus do what they wanted. He, they rubbed the bottle, but the genie never came out. And you see, sometimes that's how we deal with the Lord. We only go where the bottle is because we need something. And we rub them and we pray. We come to prayer meeting and we come to church and we give a little bit of a tithe of our tithe and, and, and we're nice. And Why? Because we want the genie to do our wishes. But he's not a genie. He's the Lord. And so he did not come the way he did not do what he, they expected him to do. And a lot of times we miss out on what he's really doing yeah. because he doesn't come the way, in the form that we expect him to. He, he, he doesn't answer our prayer the way we think he should. So we have a need and we're praying for finances and a little bit comes but we're expecting the full measure. And he says, no, if you handle this little bit and you nurture it and you steward it, what the seed that I'm giving you is actually going to be more than enough to take care of your need. And so we miss what he's doing because it doesn't come in the form that we expect him. Mary was standing at the tomb of Jesus. John chapter 20. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, 
And as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied. I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was a gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which means, which is Hebrew for teacher. Mary had expected Jesus to be king, to be that deliverer. She was one of those. Not fully understanding the kingdom that he was coming to establish. Not fully understanding why he came and to do what he did. But he dies. And she goes to the tomb expecting him to still be dead. I, I, don't, I, I just find it amusing how Jesus is always like slipping and like messing with your mind. And it's like, okay, I thought you were going to be king and then you died. Great. So you're dead. Now I come to you and I'm expecting you to be dead and now you're not. <laughs> you, you understand what I mean? And here we are. We think that we can have Jesus work within the box. We, we, we think that he can, we can just have him. He, this is all. He, okay, he died. Okay, fine. He wasn't the Lord that we were expecting. Okay, but he was a good friend of mine. I had followed him. Now I was endeared to him. And, and so, okay, fine. He's dead. Now I go to visit the dead and now he's not dead. <laughs> And, and because he was not in the form that he, she was expecting, she mi she's talking to angels. Did, that ever, did you ever catch that? It's like she's having a conversation with supernatural being, and she's not by any means startled that I'm talking to two angels. Why? Because she's missing because of the grief and because of her expectations were not met. She missed the supernatural. She's talking to angels, man. And she didn't even realize Finally, she sees Jesus, and Jesus, she's talking to Jesus, and he, she still did not recognize him because she, he was not in the form that she was expecting him to be. Until Jesus calls her by name. It was then and only then that he real, she realized that Jesus is not where she thought he was going to be, but that he is coming because he's still the king and he's still going to fulfill his promise. The disciples on the road to Emmaus, same situation. Two of them were walking the road to Emmaus and they, Jesus comes alongside of them. They didn't recognize it. Why? Because they were downcast. Now that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with one another, telling each other what had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked alongside of them. But they were kept from recognizing. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their face downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here, there in these days? What things? I love that. Just, can you see the smirk on Jesus' face? Like, what, really? What things? And they're talking about him. About Jesus of Nazareth, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped, therein lies the issue, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. They're still looking for Jesus in all the wrong form. They're still trying to fit him into the box of what a savior, what a messiah was to look like. That he was going to be a physical savior, that he was going to establish a physical kingdom. He will one day. But at this moment, it was a spiritual kingdom. We had hoped that he was going to be the one. And so today, how do we respond when God works outside of our box. I'm, I am sure that he is answering our prayer, but perhaps not just the way we think he should. I'm sure he's a answering our prayer, just not in the timeline, that, not just in the, within the deadline that we have given him. How do we respond when Jesus works outside of how we perceive him to work? Will we say, crucify him? 
or will we be like Job? The Lord gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I close with this story before Happy comes up. There was a couple and one had fallen ill with cancer and the husband was praying and, and asking the church to pray and the whole church prayed and, and they were battling this out for, for a long period of time and, and eventually, and, and everybody was so concerned about this individual who was, who, was, who was facing cancer and eventually it came to the point where she actually passed on and the husband was asked, I thought we were praying for healing, we believed for healing and his response was, she is now perfectly healed. You see, a renewed mind is submitted to the Lordship of Jesus who trusts that even if the results are not as according to my preference, he's still good. And he knows what he's doing. Thank you, Jesus. So bear with me. We're going to do this very quickly because I want to be respectful of your time. And so how does a renewed mind, having heard what Pastor Knapp had shared, how does a renewed mind interpret situations where we feel God is working outside our box? You know, there's this one Greek Stoic philosopher in the early 50 AD named Epictetus. Epictetus. And he actually taught that he said, it is not about what happens to us, but it's about how we interpret everything that happens to us. And so how we interpret everything that happens around us and to us is all based in the way our minds are wired. Our minds actually, in our minds, we have a framework. If you have, if you've ever um, gotten into doing, uh, you know, writing research paper or thesis, some of you, you will have the privilege of writing thesis and research paper, all you university students. Um, you are always asked by your thesis professor or thesis advisor, what is your framework? A framework is where your proposal or your proposed idea is based on. Your framework is based on a theory and your theory is based on a basic assumption. All of us have a basic assumption. All of us in our minds have a basic starting statement in how we view the world. All of us view everything that happens in our lives through that one basic assumption. Some of us, our basic assumption is that I am the ultimate measure of what is right and what is wrong. And so everything that happens to me, I am the ultimate measure of whether that is right or, what is that, or whether that is wrong. Some of us, our basic assumption that creates the framework of how our thoughts run in our mind is based on God is a master, uh, is a slave driver. And so I must earn the answered prayer. I must earn... I must do good work so that he will hear my prayer. And that is our basic assumption. And so anything bad that happens in our life, we automatically review what did I do wrong to deserve that. Because our basic assumption is that anything that happens to us is based on our works. Now, granted, there is sin that cause, that brings consequences, like what Pastor Knapp was saying. But every, uh, do you get the idea that all of us, that's why when Paul says, do not be conformed any, more, any longer, to the patterns. The word pattern there is exactly what that means. The framework of how the world thinks. Do not conform your thought pattern to the framework that's based on the world's theories. But rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so how does a renewed mind interpret situations? Because everything, every one of us growing up, we are constantly building and unbuilding a certain framework in our minds. All of us have a certain way of looking, thing, of looking at things. All of us have our own lenses. And that lenses are designed by the way we've, we grew up. If, for instance, I remember growing up, you know, if you had boils on your skin um, after, you know, in the mor early in the morning, I remember my, my grandmother would ask me, did you pee by the tree outside? 
oh, what's, up? what's the connection between the tr- peeing by the tree and getting boils on my skin? You know why? Because her basic presumption, your, her basic assumption is that what happens to me is based on the, on the spiritual world in the trees. <laughs> right and so there's there all of us have that in our minds and so most of our most of our premises are based on the knowledge that we have and so if we know that dogs bark at night when they're disturbed by something abnormal happening at night then we when the barks when the bark when the barks dog <laughs> when the dog barks we get up and investigate what's going on but if we didn't know that if we just think that dogs bark just because they're annoying then when the dogs bark we will just say well why did i yet why did i even buy that dog <laughs> cover your ears because your knowledge about the barking is only that barking's annoying do you get what i'm saying very simple example and so we're going to very quickly in five minutes dive into free questions that that um help us walk in a renewed mind so that we can learn to live in the life that god has called us to live even when he moves outside our box okay three questions number one we must ask ourselves how do i know god how do I know God? Number two, how do I handle our present lack of under, my present lack of understanding? How do I handle, how do we handle our lack of understanding? Number three, how do we manage our inability to control outcomes? How do we know God? Number two, how do we handle our present lack of understanding? Number three, how do we manage our inability to control outcomes? How do we know God? And so Pastor Knapp clearly explained it earlier that the Israelites knew Jesus only as the one that would save them from the Roman Empire. They did not see him as the one that would break the chains of bondage of sin. They did not see that his redemptive work was more than just setting them free free from the Roman oppression, that his redemptive work had to do with setting people, humanity free from the oppression of more than just the tyrants of the Roman Empire, but the tyranny of sin. That he was going after the tyrant of sin and death more than just the tyrants of the Roman Empire. And so they did not see that. They knew God, they knew Jesus only as the king that will set them free from the Roman Empire. The rich young ruler in Mark 10, 17, verse 18. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal, eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. And in this, this start of the conversation between Jesus and the rich young ruler, Jesus was already indicating to the rich young ruler, do you really see me as God because you called me good teacher? Or do you just see me as a teacher of, that will cause it? So, so the, I'm just, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So in that conversation, when he asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The rich young ruler, uh, Jesus said, well, you know the commandments, love the Lord your God, do this and do that. And he said, I've done all that. And then when Jesus said to him, well, there's one thing you lack, sell all your possessions and give to the poor. And we know that the rich young ruler, his face went downcast because he could not do that. Why? Because he only went to Jesus and saw Jesus as a teacher of morality. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor, teacher of morality, but not owner of everything he had. Do we see God as a moral teacher? Do we see Jesus as a moral teacher? Or do we see him as Lord? Morality versus lordship. Because if we only see Jesus as a moral teacher, the moment he gives us a command that demands us letting go of our possession or letting go of what we love or letting go of whom we love, then Jesus begins to take into the territory, enter into the territory of lordship. And that's when many of us stumble because we only want the morality but not surrender ownership. 
how do we know God? The people, the Hosanna choir, <laughs> they go, Hosanna, Hosanna. They only saw a Savior, but not Lord. And so we can see Jesus as a moral teacher, and he does teach kindness, compassion, you know, gentleness, uh, humility. He teaches all that, but he also owns everything we have. He is Lord. And the Hosanna Choir wanted the Savior, but they didn't want the Lordship. Peter, on the, other on the other hand, John 6, 68 to 69, I'm reading from the Amplified Version. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. You are our only hope. We have believed and confidently trusted, and even more, we have come to know by personal observation and experience that you are the Holy One of God, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter said this after Jesus' disciples left him because they couldn't understand the teachings of Jesus. Now he, Jesus had gathered a lot of followers after he, he healed the sick, after he, he healed Bartimaeus, after he opened the blind eyes of, of Bartimaeus, after he healed the lame man, after, after all the healings and miracles, a lot of people began to follow Jesus. When he, when he did the miracle of defeating the 5,000, a lot of people began to call themselves as disciples of Jesus. And do you know, that we can follow Jesus because of that miracle. And we've taught this before, right? We can follow Jesus because of all the miracles, but when he begins to teach us something that we do not understand easily, we can easily fall away. And here is Peter saying, Lord, this was after Jesus looked at Peter and said, will you also go? See, Jesus didn't stop them. It says, in fact, in the verse before that, that Jesus already knew who really believed. See, the believe there, we can believe Jesus because of the miracle, but can we believe in Jesus when there's no miracle happening? And here's Peter saying, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of life. Peter was declaring, Lord, I'm not just following you because you're doing something good. I'm following you because I have by personal observation and experience i have come to know that you alone there i have no other options lord i have no other options in life my career is not my option my celebrity position is not my my celebrity uh social media celebrity social media influencer <laughs> my, you know i have no other options for life my spouse is not my life my family is not my life. My marriage is not my life. You alone are the one who gives the words of life. And Peter by that was declaring, you own life itself. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The, not one of the. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And the faith that keeps us going, the renewed, the renewed mind, is that which believes that Jesus, you are the only life. So many times we pursue life not knowing we can actually walk with and dwell with life himself. You are, you alone, have the words of eternal life. I have no other option, Jesus. And, and this is our challenge today, church, is that I, we want to challenge all of us to check what, how we think about Jesus. How do we know God? Is he God for our convenience? Or is he Lord and the only Lord in life? Is he Lord or are we Lord? And he serves our needs. The renewed mind sees Jesus. Jesus refers to God as a good father. Mark 10, 18, no one is good but one. That is God. He basically was declaring there, no one is good but God. No one. And he's, he's saying that God... 
in another passage he says this is how you must pray pray our father if you put two and two together he's saying your father is good in fact in another verse so we don't have time to dig into he says it is my father's pleasure to give you the kingdom if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your father above how do we know God the renewed mind sees Jesus sees God as a good father Father, the Lord and the life he is Lord he owns every cell every organ every tissue every muscle in our body he is Lord and that's why he can heal because he owns it he is Lord over the of, over the cattle of a thousand hills and that is why he can provide the provision the healing the miracles that he that he is able to give is because he owns it does he own our situation or are we trying to own it when we're going through situations that we do not understand does he own the situation or do we try to own it how do we know God number two how do we handle our present lack of understanding John 6 60 therefore many of his disciples when they heard this said this is a hard saying who can understand it how do we handle our present lack of understanding it says in verse 66 from that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more church I, I this is very important because nowadays we are seeing a lot of even people of influence in the body of Christ turning their backs on Jesus and announcing their renunciation of their faith in public and you wonder how can you be following Jesus all this all these years and then just decide to turn your back on Jesus listen in this life there will be many circumstances many opportunities to not be able to understand why things are going on and it is in that moment that you actually are at that pivotal moment in your life where you decide what is my faith really all about Job after he was tested how many of us are familiar with the story of Job Job was tested so many times houses of his kids are burned his kids all die he gets boils he loses everything he owns his wife says you're still praising God you should curse him and Job says in Job 13 15 though he slay me yet will I trust him it does not meet human logic does not meet human rationality but it sounds like Jesus hanging on the cross who had no sin and yet was made sin and there's no logic behind him becoming sin so that we can become the righteousness of God and he's hanging on the cross and he became sin so that we can become the righteousness of God and it does not meet human logic and yet he hangs there and says father forgive them for they know not what they do though he slay me yet will I trust him what will we do with our present lack of understanding Ephesians 1 17 to 19 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the Saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power Philippians 4 verse 6 to 7 don't worry about anything instead pray about everything tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand that's why some people call us crazy rightfully so because it does not meet human logic 
But I, I propose today, church, that it is not blind faith. Because I have seen and I have tasted that the Lord is good. His promise is that he will cause all things to work together for good to those who love him and, accord, and are called according to his purpose. I remember when we first got engaged and then he got into the hospital a month after he arrived in the Philippines so that we could get married. Um, and and our, our wedding day was in December and he arrived March and immediately he went to the hospital for pancreatitis and after eating something i don't know <laughs> after eating something after pork porking <laughs> after eating those pork ribs that michelle and i and and pastor knapp got sick with we all went to the hospital um but his got worse and so immediately the doctors you know he was on tubes everything and we were getting married and and he was the doctor said it's 20 percent chance to live and and um Pastor Knapp's grandmother, grand aunt, was a doctor herself, and she used to work for uh, public health in, the, in Cebu, and she, she pulled me to the side and said, Happy, you just have to be ready. I know you guys are supposed to get married, but you have to be ready. There's only 20% chance to live. And in my mind, I am, I am thinking, I don't understand, Lord, why this is happening. You told Knapp to come home and marry me, and then now, now he has 20% chance to live. He's already dying. He's not even married me yet. <laughs> and, I, and I don't understand what's going on. But in my spirit, I knew that I knew that, Lord, you gave me a word. And so I said to my grand aunt, to our grand aunt, I said, thank you for your concern, but he will be part of the 20%. He said, you know, do you understand 20% chance to live? It means out of 100 people, only 20 people can survive this kind of, of sickness. I said, he'll be one of those 20 people. All tubes, all beep, 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 beep. And we just stood right there. It, it, he was there for three weeks, I believe. Two weeks. Used all our money for the wedding. <laughs> Plus more. Um, uh, and, and you don't understand those things. But at that moment, you just know that you know that God's going to cause all things to work together for good. This is going to work out for our good. This is going to be a powerful testimony that even in 20% chance to live, God's going to raise him from that bed of affliction. And he's going to be the man of God, God God has called him to be. My goodness, how many times have I prayed for Pastor Nap to get out of the bed of affliction? <laughs> many times. Because the enemy does not want him to fulfill the call of God in his life. There is an enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so many times, we only see what we see. We don't see the bigger picture that's happening. You don't see that while you are feeling alone in your struggle, somebody has been touched by the Holy Spirit to pray for you. You don't see that. You don't see that while you're feeling so abandoned, someone across the miles is being nudged by the Holy Spirit while at work to pray a prayer for you. You don't see that. All you see is I'm alone in my struggle. We are so limited, church. And the renewed mind chooses to see without our, even with the lack of understanding, to choose to believe that God is working behind the scenes when I'm not seeing it in front of me. He is working behind the scenes. He is working behind the scenes, but he's also working within our hearts. Now I'm getting started. <laughs> To trust even when we don't fully understand empowers us to let go and obey. And number two, to be fully at peace even when we don't understand. To be fully at peace even when we don't understand. That's why in Philippians 4, Paul tells the Philippian church that you would be filled with the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. You don't know how you are going to get formula and diapers for your children, but you just know God will never abandon me. God will never forsake me. And at the end of the day, before my child is starving, we receive a call saying, I got groceries for you. I don't understand how my provision is going to come, but I know God will never leave me nor forsake me. And that you can be fully at peace even when hell breaks loose at home. 
and you can be fully at peace that at the end of the day, God's going to cause something beautiful to come out of this mess. The renewed mind trusts in the Lord even in the middle of the mysteries of life. Do you know that our mysteries is not a mystery to God? Because our mystery is only a mystery because we're unable to see the future. We're unable to see how what happened today will impact somebody down the road. We're unable to see that what happened today will actually shape some certain events in somebody else's life that will cause them to be in a position to hear the gospel. No, we don't see. We do not see church. What I could only see, just as, just, just, when I was a kid growing up in the Philippines, every time my parents would be barbecuing, we don't have the electric grill back home. We only have charcoal. Always fan the barbecue. I always thought, I still remember, I always thought as a kid, my turn to fan the barbecue. I always thought the barbecue's feeling hot, so I gotta fan the barbecue. That's how I understood the situation. I fanned the barbecue because the barbecue's feeling hot. I was four years old. I remember very clearly, ah, I'm giving the barbecue uh, some air. And then later on as I grew older, I realized, oh, I'm fanning the barbecue so no fly would land on the barbecue. <laughs> Do you get what I mean? Because my, my mind could not understand that charcoal, that fire, it, it, heat requires oxygen to grow hotter. I did not have that capa capabil capability, capacity to understand. In the same way, many times what we don't understand that's happening in our life, we don't have the capacity at that moment to understand what God is doing. And we make assumptions. And we even make judgments, even when we don't understand. So I remember when I would not stop, you know, fanning the barbecue, because I'm afraid a fly would land on the barbecue. And I remember I asked my sister to fan the barbecue, and then she was fanning for a bit, and then later on when I got back, she, she wasn't fanning. And I'm like, the fly, the fly. <laughs> I'm not even worried about the fire, it's the fly. I'm worried about the wrong thing. <laughs> and how many times are we like that? We're worried about the wrong thing. Because <laughs> we don't understand. The renewed mind trusts in the Lord even in the middle of the mysteries of life. Number three, how do we manage our inability to control outcomes? The only thing the Bible says we have power to control is ourselves. The fruit of the Spirit, self-control. <laughs> the only thing that the Bible says we have control over is ourselves. And if we cannot even do that, what makes us think we can control anything or anyone else? <laughs> Worry is our way of trying to control something we cannot. Anger is our way of trying to control people we cannot. So when we meet people who are always worried or angry, <laughs> it has nothing to do with us. <laughs> It has to do with their fear of losing control. It's control. How do we manage our inability to control outcomes? Peter rebukes Jesus. <laughs> says, by no means you're going to go die. He wanted to control. In fact, when the, when the soldiers arrested Jesus, and Jesus already told them, I'm going to die. I'm going to go and die. For a little while, you're not going to see me. And then a little while after that, you're going to see me. He, God, Jesus already told them he's going to die. And yet, Peter wanted to control it to fit within his box. And so when the, the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, he tried to cut off Malchus' ear. Right? Because he wanted to control what is happening. How do we manage our inability to control the outcomes in our life? The disciples freaked out in the middle of the storm. And Jesus was sleeping. And I could imagine them in the middle of the storm, and they're like, 
oh my goodness, when is this storm going to end? When is Jesus going to wake up? And they're probably pushing each other, say, you wake Jesus up. No, you wake Jesus up. No, you go wake Jesus up. Finally, one of the disciples was brave enough to go down the stern and just say, Jesus, don't you care that we drown? <laughs> That's how they woke up Jesus. It's like, Mommy, I'm so hungry. Where's breakfast? <laughs> my kids never do that. <laughs> Jesus, don't you care if we drown? Oftentimes, that's how we react because of our inability to control. And we say, Jesus, so mad. I can't control anything. I'm doing the right thing, Lord, but I can't control the outcome. And how do we manage that? The renewed mind. Romans 8.28 and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Renewed mind trusts and believes that God will cause all things to work together out for our good. Number two and number three, our inability to control. And our lack of understanding. We can only trust if we know our God. If we know our God owns it all. He owns it all. He owns it all. Let him own the bad things. Let him own the good things. Let him own the things that we think we should own. He is. The, you know that the word Lord means owner? So when we say, Lord, that means we're saying you're the owner. You own me. You own my life. You own my, one way or another, we are owned. Question is, who owns us? Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus.